My, good evening. My name is Paul Larner, and I'm chairman of the board of Wakefield Country Day School. This is the second in the series of WCDS Fall Online Speakers Series. Tonight, Flint Hill resident Ralph Bates is going to speak to us about bird watching in Rappahannock County and our surroundings. Ralph is an avid bird watcher, and although I've not been on, on an outing with Ralph recently i still remember when rosina and i spent an early morning in his hands of, in the hands of his expertise at caledonia farm ralph and his wife gwen also have the distinction of being former peace corps volunteers in central america before i turn the screen over to ralph i mentioned the schedule schedule for the remaining two wcds fall seminars all at 7 p.m. and actually three. October 21st, Flint Hill resident Paul Smith, who has argued many Supreme Court cases on election law, will provide a most timely update on the 2020 presidential election law. On October 28th, I will interview my good friend Lacey Wright about his 50 plus year service as a foreign service officer, including his time in Vietnam, Italy, Laos, Jamaica, and Brazil, where he was acting ambassador. And lastly, we'll close with another local, John McCaslin, who's a former White House correspondent and editor of our own RAP News. You can find information on our seminars and listen to previous recordings at wcdsva.org. Lastly, perhaps most importantly, we are a small school of very modest means. So donations to, to defray the cost of these seminars and otherwise support WCDS are most welcome at the donate button on our website. With that, I'll turn it over to Ralph Bates. Well, Paul, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate that. And I just, I don't, I- Ralph, I don't, it's I, all yours. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you for that, Paul. Um, I, I want to un endorse for the audience, um, uh, uh, going to your next session with, is it Paul Smith, isn't it? I've, I've just yeah. blanked. Uh, I've seen him present and it is a wonderful yeah. presentation. Um, and of course, John is always um, excellent. And your other guest, I don't know, and maybe I'll tune in. But anyway, it's it's really a, it's really great to be here. Hello, bird lovers, and I'm assuming uh, that you either are, or by the end of this uh, evening, you will be. Um, I would really like to characterize this talk uh, that it will be an experience for all of you that is as real as a tweet or a real tweet, if you want to look at it that way. Now, I know that's a little obscure, and my daughter, who's now in her 40s, would be saying when she was nine or 10, oh, dad, you're so corny. Anyway, so I hope this truly is a tweet for you tonight. Um, anyway, um, I can't see you if you raise your hand, so I'm not gonna ask you to do that. But my assumption is, especially since there are a lot of students in the group uh, from school, that many of you, if not most, are beginners in the birding area. And so in terms of trying to figure out who the audience would be, it is kind of positioned a little bit more toward beginning birders. And I just want to admit from the outset that I consider myself a beginning birder. I'm 78 years old. However, I did begin birding in the fourth grade, if you can believe that. Uh, it was because my fourth grade teacher, Miss Wallace, had a contest for a number of us, whoever wanted to participate, to go out and observe birds in La Crosse, Wisconsin, on the western side, and then come back to class and report on the birds. And for every one of the birds we got that she would validate we got, uh, we got a little sticker. Some of you remember those. With, in this case, it was just a, a picture of a bird. And so I uh, had a competition with the students and about eight of us participated. participated and um, Mike Crandall and I came out 
uh, on top, but I was on top. So that was the beginning of my interest in birds and birding. Another small story is that my mother, who whistled very beautifully, uh, could imitate a cardinal. And uh, you all know, I'm sure, that the cardinal is the state bird of Virginia. So that also kind of catapulted me into the world of birding along with hunting birds, which I shouldn't admit, with my father uh, in uh, the fields of Wisconsin. Uh, we ate them, we just didn't shoot them, if that makes any difference. So that's when it began. Now, to fully disclose the truth of that, it sounds like I've been a birder forever, 74 years, not true. Um, I left uh, birding as I went into high school, college, on and on in my life, and didn't come back to it uh, until about 40 years ago. So while I can say I'm a lifelong birder, that's a bit of a misstatement in terms of my biography. Um, but I have gotten more and more engaged in it. And why do I consider myself a, a beginning birder? Well, because um, just to give you some statistics, there are a lot of birds out there that you and I will never see in our life. There's a lot of beauty associated with birds, not only in their colors and their feathers and their behavior, but certainly in their songs and their calls and all of that. But you might want to know that there are 18,000 birds in the world, according to latest estimates. In the US, so you can look at some comparisons, there are about 860 species in the United States. Um, about 520 species in Canada. Some of those would be the same species as, as are in the United States. Uh, then comparatively also, in Virginia, there are about 430 species that are recorded here. Uh, in our area, here in the Rappahannock area and in the east side of the um, Shenandoah National Park, we have probably about 130 species. It could go up or down depending on migrations and all that. Comparatively in terms of other countries, now we're huge, right? Big country, 3,000 miles from coast to coast, more or less. Um, little Costa Rica, where I spent three years as an administrative and manager in uh, Costa Rica with the Peace Corps, uh, Costa Rica has uh, about 857 birds. So they have more birds there. As you get into the subtropics and the tropics, you can expect that. Uh, Colombia, where I also spent a couple of years, has 1,900 birds. And they argue with Peru, who claims they have more birds than Colombia, but the records seem to show that Peru has got 1,950 birds, if you want to, you know, fuss with 50, but they argue about that. A little bit about the bird population in the U.S., and this is not good news if you don't know it, but it is not good news. Um, in the last 50 years, the bird population in the United States alone has declined by 40%. Let that settle in. 40% of the birds have been lost, uh, or an estimated 3 billion birds over that period of time. Well, you might ask yourself the question, why is that? Well, Look at the names on this screen and look at who we are. We're human beings. We are the primary reason for all of that bird loss. And I won't go into all of the things that count for loss of birds in, in the world. Uh, you'll get it in a handout later. And I think some things will really shock you uh, that you hadn't thought of. And some you won't want to believe are true, but they are. Um, but so we have a lot to do to restore bird population and save it from declining uh, even worse, but it's likely to continue to, to decline in ter terms of the, the um, statistics. Um, so I consider myself, if it makes you feel any better, just an advanced beginner. Uh, I've been doing it for 40 years with some seriousness and also a lot of casual birding which is probably the best way for everyone to start because that's where you have to start. Uh, casual means you go out maybe for a couple of hours and just kind of try to see birds or you sit on your deck and you listen and see birds. You might have binoculars, which I would recommend to be able to see them. So you'll begin as be beginners and you'll find the joy and beauty that I do in um, every time, whether I'm being casual or being serious. And I've gone on some serious birding trips around the world. 
Uh, one in particular, which you'll find interesting, I think, is my wife and I went about six years ago to Peru and birding in the mountains and uh, in the uh, Amazon basin and all of that. And there was a group with us on this bus that looked like truly serious birders. And I was humble enough to know I'm not a real serious birder. And I was just dying to find out how many birds they had because I was going to tell them how many birds I had on what's called a life list, which is when you write those all down. Uh, I was smart enough to know I shouldn't come out and say, gee, I've got 800 birds on my life list. And I asked. One guy had 3,000 birds. A woman had 3,500 birds. And they travel all over the world to see the most obscure birds that I would never have heard of or seen. And what a wonderful life they must have doing that. Right now, my life list is up to about um, 120. Another thing I enjoy doing with birds, and I'm going to emphasize listening to birds, because you're liable to hear them before you see them and liable to hear them and never see them. I can identify on a good day about 120 to 130 birds. And that is not just in this area, but as I travel around the country. So uh, song is something I pay a lot of attention to, their calls, their, their noises, and all of that. I would encourage some of you who will be here in spring next year, if you're interested, to keep an eye on Rappahannock uh, um, Continuing Education. RCE used to be called RAPNET, I'm sorry, RAP, um, RAPU, RAP University. And uh, I missed the fourth year because of COVID, and I hope to have the fourth year to be able to take out 10 to 15 people on a wonderful private preserve uh, about five times uh, to spend a couple hours every morning, starting at about six or seven in the morning in the spring uh, to um, learn about how to see birds, identify them, uh, what you need to be doing to be effective at that. So that is um, a little bit of my background and I'm gonna ask you to make mental notes uh, if you have questions you want later. Um, and I want to move on to a bird video. And the reason I want to do that is because uh, it will introduce you to a number of things about birds. Number one, this is about winter birds in our area. And you'll see uh, birds that you probably don't recognize, even though you might have if you saw them in the summer and the spring. Uh, but it'll also give you an idea of the confusion sometimes there is in identifying birds. Now, the cardinal is not hard to identify, right? I'd ask you to all raise your hand if you've seen a cardinal, but you couldn't raise your hand because I can't see your picture. <laughs> so let me turn to that uh, video, and uh, I'll, I'll walk you through it. In a few cases, I will speak over what you're seeing, so you hear my voice. In a couple of cases, I will stop it and make some comments for you. But this is a, a chance for you to see the beauty of birds in the fall, which remember, we're in the fall and winter, so you're gonna be able to see these birds from now until the spring, and they're very common to hear. Notice the colors and the striping. I don't think I've ever seen those. Now this one, uh, yeah, the first one is sometimes hard to see unless you're closer to the mountains. The purple finch is also not as common, but you can see them uh, moving in and out. Notice the song, quite beautiful. And the colors. Lovely bird. Okay, now this is a house finch. The song is different. Okay, there you can see the difference there you can see the difference between the, uh, the, the, the finches. And uh, I still sometimes get confused. 
even after all these years, but I don't often see um, purple finches. So my confusion is uh, because of not enough practice perhaps, or just one day not being as bright as another day. Now we all know the goldfinch, right? This is their winter, winter plumage. That would be a male who would be much more bright, brighter in color in the, in the summertime. The cardinal has many songs. That's the, one of the common ones. The cardinal doesn't change colors very much regardless of the senior, season, at least the, the male. Now that's the female, northern cardinal. I think that's as beautiful as the male, but doesn't get the credit. <laughs> Look at that. Aren't those gorgeous? <laughs> chicka dee dee dee, chicka dee dee dee, chicka dee dee dee. That's what it's saying. One of, my, one of my favorite birds, and I can imitate that bird and call it over. You, you could actually whistle it and it'll, it'll come to you? Indeed. Wow. They also have many songs. I can't do all their songs though. This is the female downy. Now notice the female's colors, all black and white. Now, what a surprise, there's a male gets the little red topping. Very common. One of my favorite birds. Robin. Robin. Now that's the male. Now there's the female. The male's red is across from the beak all the way back. The female's got a break between the beak and the top of the head. I like these ones. Yeah, they're they're really nice. They're, they're not often you don't see them. I mean, they're, they're sometimes you got to be more into the forest area. This one's so common. I love it. I can't imitate that one. Very common. You'll see them a lot along roadsides and in the hedges. And... The pine warbler, uh, warblers in general, are what people really want to see on my birding uh, in my birding class in the springtime because their, their color is very different by that time. And of course, they are one of the prettier species of birds. And in the wintertime, I have great trouble differentiating between many of the warbler um, uh, varieties. Um, but it's kind of the premier species of the bird kingdom in our world here. Because they're rare or beautiful or? You're breaking up. Is it, is it, why are they the premier species? Because they're the way they look or the way they sound or? All, all of those things. <laughs> this is a relatively common warbler here that you're likely to see. Pine warbler a little harder. Okay, no orange crown on that one, right? 
because they're losing their color or lost it. Aha, an orange crown, hardly distinguishable. That's what's exciting about bird watching. This one is so common in our area. And if you haven't been awakened in the morning by its song, you haven't lived. Leave your window open. Ralph, I heard once that uh, the wrens were hated in the Middle Ages because of their annoying song. There's, there's, reason, there's reason to get annoyed with them today. There's no question. <laughs> uh, one of the things about the wren, and you'll hear if you go with me and, and, and get more into birds, birds have songs that can be replicated by the language. And often people say the Carolina wren sounds like this, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. So trust me. <laughs> but it has many songs. It has many, many songs. One of my favorite birds, noisy, collective, in groups, flocks, big and scare all the other birds away, but that's not. This one you also see a lot around here. Hardly see the female as much, mostly the male. Now, if you haven't heard this one, you're missing something. It sounds like a lot of birds. It's one of the best mimic uh, in the birds. Bird. Uh... Let me just let me just stop here for a minute. I, I, about the uh, the uh, mockingbird, they hang around the houses, so you should be able to hear them almost any time of day. They sing on and on and on. Along with the wren, you want to kill them sometimes because they sing on and on and on. But uh, people think that the mockingbird has the most variety of songs that it mimics. Not so. We won't see it, but a bird called the brown thrasher has, believe it or not, 1,500 mimic songs. 1,500. The mockingbird has a couple of hundred, maybe, but pales by comparison. Have you heard that one? They're very common in this area. And they're noisy and beautiful and not to be feared. Uh, I'll, st I'll stop on the red-shouldered hawk, and let me just say this. You heard the blue jay. Blue jays are also mimics, but they don't have the repertoire of the, many of the birds you've seen here. But often I get confused. I hear what I think is a red-shouldered hawk, and I say to my wife, let's wait a minute to make sure that isn't a blue jay mimicking the red-shouldered hawk. And often it is the blue jay making that exact sound that you heard. So anyway, um, that's all we're going to do with seeing birds uh, at, at this moment. Um, well, what I'd like to do, yes, who has a question? Someone having a question? Why would one bird mimic another bird? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe they're stage comics. Um, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, they use it to attract mates. They use it to define their territory. Um, and other reasons than that, I'm not sure, Sharon. Good question. Okay, uh, we're going to enter the uh, Q&A period um, right now. Um, and um, what I'd like to do is um, I have prepared, as I do for my course, about five different handouts 
that um, Lila is going to post um, uh, down below in the screen. And as they're posted, you can um, either download them while the Q&A is going on, or you can send an email to Lila to get those, um, those um, handouts. Uh, they go into some practical things like uh, what are the binoculars to buy at, at reasonable costs? What are the kinds of things you need to do when you're doing a more than kind of strolling, birding uh, experience and you want to be serious about it by walking slowly and listening very closely and taking minutes and sometimes five or ten minutes to try and identify and, and observe a bird? Um, and also with a, a lot of information about birding guides that you can get um, if you um, don't have one. The one that I would recommend for beginners here, especially in this region, is Birds of Virginia. You'll see that on the list. There are apps um, that you can get and put on your iPhone uh, or your um, whatever it's called um, and uh, that will help you uh, identify birds and start recording your own list if you want to do that. There are websites that you can go to that um, will uh, give you all kinds of information about birds and feeding and um, uh, mating and eggs, all the kinds of things, plus the sounds. You want to hear the sounds. Um, so I think those would be practical to have in your file if you're serious about considering uh, becoming a casual birder, which is where you're going to have to start anyway. So. Um, let me open it up to questions. Uh, Ralph? Yeah, Tony. Hi. Uh, one of the things, talking about why birds mimic each other, I always heard that blue jays mimic predatory birds as a way of scaring off other birds. I don't know if that's true or not, I, and if you had any experience uh, with that. Well, and also that blue jays will flit through the woods and they will call it an alarm when they see an owl or a hawk. Yes, they will, as, as do uh, many birds. Uh, almost all birds have alarm calls, and I can't, I can't differentiate when it's an alarm or it's, I don't know why they're alarmed with me when I'm going out to the feeder uh, to live them, give them feed. But yeah, it would have to do with that. I think you're right. They're, they're um, uh, letting other birds know that they're there, and so they should be alarmed even though they're not the hawk. But that's something anyone can Google, I might encourage you. Yeah, I, I use your talk about apps, I, and, I, and I'm familiar with the book about the birds of Virginia. It's a nice, small, specific to Virginia birding book, which I really like, and uh, um, also, uh, the National Audubon Society app is really quite good as well. I, I think I, anyway. Yeah, that's the one I have and use. And you can take them in the field with it. There's one that I'm referencing in there that I'm going to get, which has an, um, an, an artificial intelligence ca capacity that if you um, uh, bring a picture of a bird home and you don't know what it is, or uh, you are able to show it from your camera if you have a camera. It will automatically identify the bird for you while you're in the field. But you've got to have some connection with uh, the internet or whatever to, to, do, that, to do that. So it's, it's evolving to make it a lot easier for us to really get deeply into birding. Other questions? Um, I was recently given a hummingbird feeder with that red syrup, but I, th I think I've heard it's not good for them. Well, I wouldn't use the, I wouldn't use the red syrup. Do a, a, a one part sugar to four parts water mixture and use that. Um, you just heat it up enough so that all the sugar um, dissolves and you pour it in. And um, the thing about any bird feeder is you got to be careful uh, to make sure you clean them relatively frequently so that you don't transmit diseases. One disease that's going around right now is uh, and has forever uh, for uh, house finches and other finches is um, an eye disease that you get at bird feeders. Uh, they get. Other birds don't seem to be bothered by them. Uh, 
but they can go blind and then they can die. Wow. Other things. Cole, you're raising your hand. You're, you're muted. Cole, you're muted if you're trying to talk or Bill. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, go, go Cole. Okay, um, yes, um, I live in Woodville and we have mockingbirds here and on the Red Oak Mountain, which is just next to Woodville, which is at a 1300 feet, there's yeah. no mockingbirds up there. Do mockingbirds not like to be at altitude? I don't think it's altitude. Mockingbirds tend to like to hang around uh, populated areas. Uh, I'm assuming that's because there's a lot more food for them that's easy to get. Uh, there might be other reasons too. Uh, it could be territorial in terms of other birds that um, dominate, but um, certainly mockingbirds, if you want to see mockingbirds, you can go to almost any place that's populated and you'll probably see them with their trees and things like that. Best answer I can yeah, that, that's that's my, been my experience too. I live on top of a little mountain at 1,500 eleva feet elevation uh, in Bean Hollow near Flint Hill. And uh, I've never seen a mockingbird up here. But as soon as I get off the mountain and into Bean Hollow, um, they're everywhere. Yeah, they, they, um, uh, they're smart. They've adapted to uh, all, this peop all the people on the earth. Um, Bill, uh, Bynum, where did you go? Hi, hi Ralph. Hi. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned that you always see the male, uh, mostly male red wings and not the female. Is that right. because there's more males or just because the females have different habits and just don't come out or what's, what's that about? Well, I, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I think that it, I think it has to do with the females stick closer to home. And um, they probably move on after the birds have fledged and gotten, you know, out of the nest and all of that. But I'm not sure. That's a good question uh, worth investigating. Uh, when I was on a birding expedition for six days down in South Texas, I had the very exciting experience of uh, witnessing thousands of red-winged blackbirds and other blackbirds around granaries down there. Uh, and as far as I could tell, there weren't that many females in that population either. Now, I don't know why, and I suppose I should have asked the bird expert that was our guide, but it was just amazing to see that many birds at, at, at one time. Uh, same, same with uh, uh, boat-tailed grackles, uh, and uh, we saw about 5,000 of those in the time I was there, about 5,000 redhead uh, ducks in formation flying out of the preserve, who knows where they were going but really quite something. Anyone else? I have a question. I wanted to ask about a murmuration. I saw one the other day, and I, of course, you can't tell what they are. One, is it just grackles or is it? I'm sorry, Madeline, you were breaking up. Yeah, uh, you, you, you've, you've, you've gone breaking off. Breaking up, I'll type. Anyone else? Can you hear me? Who's no? that? Francie. Oh, hey, Francie. How are you doing? Okay. Good to see you. We had a yellow-billed cuckoo fly into a window here this spring. Uh -huh. And I wondered, I'd never seen one here before. Is that really unusual? No, I hear them almost every year up on uh, Big Bastard Mountain or the peak. Probably more Big Bastard Mountain because we live in, in Huntley. Um, yeah, no, that's not unusual. Uh, another friend of ours who you know, John Lisinski and Heidi, actually found one with a broken wing. And it um, uh, must have flown into their window too. But no, they're not, they're not unusual. And uh, uh, they have a very distinctive call, which I, I won't embarrass myself to try and make it because I'd have to hear it first, but I could do it. Uh, and I have called them over. Um, which is interesting. I, so they came down to check on who's making that call. <laughs> anyway. <Yeah. laughs> That's fun. One of my favorite, I got to tell you this, uh, one of my favorite experiences, uh, and it's happened twice, is uh, great horned owls. Okay. First of all, we had a trio here one winter that I would go out and listen to at night, and I called it the three tenors. 
if you remember Opera and Placido Domingo and others. And they literally had different calls, okay? Well, one night that wasn't the case and it was a moonlit night and I went out and I heard this a great horn not far from us. And so I said, well, I've done this before. Let me see if it works. And I had done it in daylight before. Um, let's see if it works. And I made the sound of the great horned owl and continued making it. And I thought I was getting answers and I think that's what happened because it wasn't long before that great horned owl came flying over the trees and in the moonlight, in the background, came down and settled in a large evergreen here to our left, about maybe 100 feet from us. And I just was awestruck to see that wonderful creature at the top of that tree. And I continued to talk with it. And it answered me. Well, I came to find out that it was mating season. And so I think uh -huh. the bird got a little confused. And I was then reprimanded by a much more expert birder that you shouldn't do that during mating season. Uh, they, mate, they mate in the winter. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? I have lots of stories, but I don't know if we're going to run out of time if Paul pulls the plug. <laughs> I'm going to try again, uh, Ralph. I don't know if you can sure. hear me. Yeah, I got gotcha. um, Are we likely to see any murmurations? I saw one. Uh, a few weeks ago, and if we do see them around here, what m birds would they be making? Would would be would compose them? What now you're talking about a big a murmuration is sometimes called a a um, whatever, but murmuration is something I thought I did in my sleep, uh, but it's not. I know that a murmuration is a large flock in the sky, and they all kind of seem to dance. Is that what you're referring to? They fly in unison. Well, first of all, I do that because it's, it's generally a way of protecting themselves. And the other night we were at the blue door and we had a murmuration there. And as far as I can tell, they're grackles, okay? So it could have been starlings also, but the noises they were making and their shape in the sky, was, it was grackles and it was a large amount. Now, what I saw in Texas put those little murmurations to shame. But um, yeah, they're, they're, all, they're also coming together, swarming, to get ready for the move south. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to see those. Um, it, it was that the only question you had? I think it was. Um, but Yes, thank you. Right. Yeah. Anything else? It's hard to tell. If you go up on a hilltop here in the county at night, can you hear migrating birds right now? You probably could. You probably could. Um, uh, you might need some sort of device that would help you hear them because they're sometimes quite high up. I've never tried that, Cole, but uh, that, would be, that would be interesting. And by the way, um, windows in large buildings are one of the major causes of death of birds. Small windows too, but large windows, uh, skyscrapers. And Probably the only way to stop that from happening, which would save a lot of energy, is to turn off the damn lights um, and, you know, have safety lights on the top of the building, but not have the lights on in the building because they fly toward light. And that's what causes so many to die. What else? Ralph, should we feed birds in the wintertime? Oh, sure. I don't know what your situation is, but I have feeders that I put out in the wintertime, so I, I ha always have a good uh, um, display. Um, but you should, but you probably are going to have to do what you would want to do anyway, which is they'll be more active in the morning uh, from sun up for a few hours thereafter and go out and listen. And if you listen, if you're around some trees or if it's not just open field, um, you'll get a sense of where they are and you might even begin to be able to identify who and what they are. Um, but that would be with your binoculars, give you a chance to see them. If you have feeders, no question. Uh, you'll see them on road signs, you'll see them on wires, you'll see them, uh, especially birds that live that way. Um, so yeah, put some suet out and you'll attract woodpeckers. Oh, well, the next show. 
Yeah, who is? Who well, is that? yeah, Paul. Well, are there? I was just going to ask if there are any more questions. You're obviously a a very popular man, a very popular <laughs> speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Were there any more questions? If, um, I've got one if question. If not, then. Oliver? Okay, go ahead. Oh, you're talking about just the email in for yeah. Talking Did, about what? Starlings. I've heard that Starlings are invasive. Are we in, are you in favor of Starlings being suppressed? <laughs> no, I don't I don't want any birds to be suppressed. Um, one of the biggest suppressors of birds, and I hate to say this as a way to end on a, a, a negative note, are cats. Mm. Um, they kill not, not house cats as much as feral cats, but we have some incredible number of feral cats. Um, uh, there are an estimated 60 million feral cats in the United States. And of course, to kill a feral cat in this state is a felony. So we wouldn't be doing that. There are about 195 million domestic cats, and I urge people to keep them inside. Uh, they're not meant to be outside, I'm sorry. But um, the, they're one of the biggest reasons we're losing a big amount of uh, birds. But windows, severe storms, climate change, loss of food, especially insects, pesticides, herbicides, habitat loss, uh, you name it. We have created a world in which it makes it hard for our bird population to, to continue to live. And um, interesting correlation between the decline in insects and the decline in birds, which they, in birds, rely a lot on insects. But as the insects, especially butterflies and bees, diminish, we have fewer pollinators. And if you don't understand what pollination does for our food supply, then I suggest you go online and look into it. Um, so I'm making my pitch for not only being bird lovers, but being bird protectors and uh, do more that we can do to uh, to save our earth. Here, here. Thanks, Ralph. Thank, thank you, you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Oh. Great fun. Thank you, Ralph. Go out and enjoy the songs and sounds and colors of birds. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Ralph. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.